Hey everyone, Crow back again, and I recently finished playing the games in this Evercade cartridge containing Alwa's Awakening and Cathedral. This is part number 27 in the console line, and it is the second dual game Evercade cartridge, with the first being the Xeno Crisis Tanglewood cart. However, whereas Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood were two totally different types of games, Alwa's Awakening and Cathedral are both Metroidvanias in that they are both action platformers where new areas of the game are made accessible as your character gains new abilities. So odds are, if you like one of these games, then you're going to like the other one as well. As with every Evercade release, the cartridge comes in a clamshell case, along with a full color manual. There are no bonus items included here, but the manual is designed so it looks like it's for one game, but if you flip it over, you'll see the manual for the other game. Now before I start talking about these games individually, I just want to mention that I played both these games on the Evercade VS. With Owl's Awakening, I used an arcade stick. With Cathedral, I tried to play with an arcade stick and I just kept hitting the wrong buttons and it really wasn't working out for me. So I switched. Instead, I was using the 8 bit Doe SM30 Pro. I didn't even try to play the game using the standard Evercade controller. I'm sure it works fine. I didn't play it in the handheld. Uh, but, you know, these are the controllers I, I prefer playing with, so that's what I played with. So let's get started with our first game. Owl's Awakening was developed by Elden Pixels and was originally released in 2017 on Steam and over the next couple of years was subsequently released on the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. The game was advertised as an NES-inspired adventure game with the authentic feel and look of a Nintendo 8-bit game. Well, I guess it really wasn't authentic enough, because in 2022, Elden Pixels released a quote-unquote enhanced updated version that will actually run on an NES or NES emulator, going under the title Alwa's Awakening The 8-Bit Edition. This is the version of the game in this Evercade cartridge. Now, it's sort of ironic to call this updated version enhanced, because in order to actually run on NES hardware, the game's graphics were downgraded slightly, and the aspect ratio had to be changed from 16.9 to 4.3. But apparently new areas and abilities were added. So yeah, I guess it could be considered an enhanced or remastered version of the game. Now I'm just going to have to take their word for it at the moment since I've not played through the original game, but I do currently own it on Steam. As for the game itself, you play as Zoe, a girl who likes to play video games, who falls asleep one day and finds herself awakening in the land of Awa, which has been taken over by the evil vicar and his four protectors. Zoe must defeat the four protectors and collect the items they are holding before she is able to face the evil vicar and save the land of Awa. When you start the game, you'll have absolutely nothing, not even a weapon. But fortunately, you'll find a staff rather close to your starting point, and thwacking creatures will be your main form of attack for virtually the entire game. There is no set path to proceed throughout the game as you'll mostly be exploring and finding items and abilities that will enable you to gain access to new areas throughout the game. The second item you'll more than likely acquire is a map that will automatically mark your progress throughout the game, making it easy to identify the areas you haven't been to. Eventually, you'll gain access to three abilities, creating a block, creating a bubble, and shooting an electrical projectile. Some of these abilities have upgrades that can also be found to make them more versatile, and it's by using these abilities that will help you access new areas and defeat bosses. You'll only be able to use these abilities when your magic meter is full, and it's not something you really have to worry about as it'll refill automatically. It's really just there so you can't spam abilities and circumvent the game's intended challenge. Of course, in a game like this, you'll have your occasional save point, so if you die, you have a place to respond. And there are also warp points to make navigating vast distances less of a chore. There are also various objects to pick up throughout the game, but I want to mention the 99 blue orbs that are scattered throughout the game because I wasn't really clear on what they were intended for initially. But it turns out, the more of them you possess when you encounter a boss will lower their health based on how many you have, making the fight a bit easier. I enjoy these types of games because I usually will try to find everything before finishing the game. I think I'd found about 91 of the 99 blue orbs before I gave up and started looking online for clues as to where the other ones were hiding. 
I found that this game loves to put up false walls all over the place, and eventually I just found myself pushing up against any walls I saw just to see if I could walk through it. Many of the items are hidden in this way, and I think there's actually false walls you'll need to go through in order to finish the game. Or maybe not, I don't know, I, there were just so many of them I'm not even sure at this point. Also, even though the game does its best to prevent you from getting into areas without the proper abilities, I was able to sequence break at least one part of the game by jumping over a gap the game assumed I wouldn't be able to. The problem was that I wasn't able to leave the area in the same way, but fortunately I could purposely die so I could respawn at a previous checkpoint and it even let me keep the item I collected to boot. If I had any real complaints about the game, it would be the ending, which I found to be incredibly lacking. I'm not entirely sure if there are alternate endings, but I had collected 100% of the items and covered 99% of the map. I'm still not sure where that 1% I missed was, and that's the thing. This game could keep people coming back to solve its mysteries, but it also could have people coming back for speedruns, as I know this is the case with the original game. Alright, I had intended that to be the end of the Always Awakening segment of the video. However, as I was putting the video together, I ran across something that was pretty cool. If you go to EldenPixels.com and you click on, well, you can highlight up here Always Awakening. You have a couple options. And one of them is for soundtrack. So if you click on the soundtrack, uh, that's what I was kind of looking for. I was kind of looking for music for, for the game. Um, here's the, you could listen to the official soundtrack on Spotify, YouTube, and, but that's not the cool part. Now, apparently there's an Always Waking NES soundtrack and you could buy it, but I'm not going to kind of explain that. It'll become obvious what that is if we scroll down to here and NES ROM download. So if you don't want to spend money getting an actual physical NES soundtrack, you can always download it completely for free. So basically, these, these cartridges here, you pop them in your NES and just play the soundtrack to the game. But for free, completely for free, you could download the NES ROM and just pop it into any old emulator and listen to it. And that's what I've done here. So I've got Messin running. I pop the, uh, the uh, ROM into this emulator. And as soon as it comes up, it just starts playing the theme of Zoe. And if I push um, up and down, you could cycle through the tracks. And I just thought that was pretty cool. And the only reason I'm putting it in this video right now is because it's completely free and it's something that you can do. I'll try to put a link in the description uh, below in case I didn't put it in the video or you forgot to write it down or something. Beginning development in 2014, Cathedral was released five years later in 2019 on Steam by December Born Interactive. It was later released on PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch. In fact, I already had a physical copy of this game as it was the seventh release from Premium Edition Games. And much like Evercade releases, I usually purchase everything Premium Edition puts out. Now with Premium Edition releases, they also include a challenge card, and if you meet the challenge and follow the instructions, they'll send you a patch in the mail, much like Activision did for their releases on the Atari 2600. So I'd already played Cathedral on the Switch, but only up to the part of the game that was necessary to get the patch. Then Cathedral was announced for the Evercade, and I decided to wait to play it again until I could do so on the Evercade. Now Cathedral on the Evercade is a bit special because it's the only game released for the platform so far that isn't running on emulation. Well, I guess that's not exactly true, as there are two other games currently playable on the Evercade that are run natively, but those games are secret hidden games. Cathedral is the first game running natively on the Evercade that was included on a cartridge with the port being done by the original developer, December Born Interactive. However, as a side effect of this game not running through emulation, the standard Evercade menu that appears when you press the home button during a game doesn't appear. Rather, it's the games menu which will allow you to resume the game, bring up game options, go back to the main menu, or quit the game entirely. This means there is no save state feature with this game. At first, this may seem disappointing, but ultimately I don't think it was that great a loss, and I'll get into why a bit later. 
For now, I suppose I should actually get to what this game is about. Well, you play as an unknown knight who just appears in a cathedral. He's got amnesia, so he knows just about as much as we do when we start playing. After a bit of exploration, we keep bumping into this red hooded spirit that begins to impede our progress. He winds up trapped, and we free him after he says he'll make it worth our while. But as soon as he's free, he causes us to plummet all the way to the ground, knocking us out. Fortunately, a health mage is nearby and brings us back to town and heals us. Seeking answers, we travel back to the cathedral and encounter the red hooded spirit again, who tells us his name is Sol, and he's not sure how he wound up there either, and apologizes for knocking us off the cathedral, as that wasn't his intent. He brings us to a mysterious locked door in the cathedral and shows us that an orb he had collected reacts with the door. And there are spots for four more orbs and suggests we travel together to discover the purpose of the orbs and what lay beyond the door. And from that point on, he does travel along with us, albeit invisibly, until we need him. Now, it may seem like maybe I said too much about the story, but really that's the tip of the iceberg. Those are all things that happen within the first hour of a game I spent over 30 hours playing. In fact, Cathedral is probably the game I spent the most time playing on the Evercade so far. It's definitely a fun game with a lot of exploration and some puzzle solving, but just controlling the unnamed knight is incredibly fun. As a Metroidvania, your abilities at the beginning are extremely limited, as you can only really swing your sword and jump. But the rapid attack of the sword is pretty cool, and the downward thrust attack is very satisfying and actually very necessary for some parts of the game. And from there, you'll just keep gaining abilities, starting with a shield to be able to block certain attacks, the ability to double jump, and the ability to dash. Your soul companion will even help out by gaining the ability to be controlled remotely for a limited amount of time, or to act as kind of a parachute to help slow your rate of descent when falling. Throughout the game, you'll also find armor augmentation and new weapons and tools, such as the Magnus apparatus for projectile attacks, a lantern that emits a green flame, and a bone wand that will create temporary floating platforms. The cool thing about all this is you can tell what you have equipped just by looking at your character as he will actually be holding the item you currently have selected. I also thought it was pretty cool how the color of your armor changes based on the type of augmentation you've collected. You'll also collect bottles throughout the game as well as those act as a way to instantly heal yourself when you need to. Now remember when I said it didn't matter so much that this game doesn't have save states? Well that's because the game has an autosave feature and you don't have a limited amount of lives. Checkpoints are fairly frequent and when you die you'll instantly reappear at the last checkpoint you crossed with all your bottles automatically refilled no less. Even if you've collected an item and then died immediately afterwards, you still keep the item. There is one downside to dying though, and that's that you'll lose a portion of the money you're currently carrying with you. Money in this game is a bit important because every village you'll encounter will have a shop where you can buy important upgrades. Shops also act as banks, and any money you put in the bank will be safe as you won't lose any of it when you die. There are several bosses in the game, and at times they can be pretty difficult, but at the same time, they are incredibly fun to fight. Sometimes it's as simple as figuring out the boss's tells and patterns, but sometimes you'll need to figure out what you need to do in order to even damage the boss in the first place. I'll say that every boss fight was unique, challenging, and really fun. In addition to your main quest, there were several side quests that were not necessary to beat the game, but every side quest had a pretty good reward once completed. Some of these quests even lead to optional bosses that are somehow even more unique to fight than the standard bosses, such as the giant sewer rat or the blood knot. But the one side quest I kind of got obsessed with is the one you'll start near the beginning of the game, but won't be able to finish until close to the end. In the first town, there's a library that's run by who else but Conan the Librarian. He's Conan the Librarian. And he says that some punk stole a bunch of his books and he'll reward us if we can find and return them. Well, there are 100 books to find in total, and while some are hidden pretty good, some of them will be in plain sight, but you won't be able to reach them until you get upgrades that won't be available until later in the game. However, it's worth it to return whatever books you can, 
because not only will Conan reward you with money for every book you return, but you'll get an even bigger reward for every certain number of books you give him, and I'm not just talking about money here. Right before I was going to finish the game, it bothered me that I was still missing 18 books, so I wound up turning to the internet to find the ones I was missing, and it still wasn't that easy. Even though the game tells you how many books you're missing in each area of the game, I still had to search each potential book location in the areas I didn't collect them, because there was no way I was going to remember exactly which books I had already found. But I did it because I found the exploration to be fun. There were only two sections of the game I didn't like so much, and one involved having to constantly create flames that kept going out in order to make my way around a pitch black room with ghosts that keep appearing when too few flames are lit. There are actually a few areas like that in one section of the game. The other is sort of the same deal as there's these mines in one portion of the game where ghosts keep appearing, but these ghosts will constantly shoot projectiles at you and there's no map to reference for that part of the game. But in reality, that's only a small fraction of the game. I wasn't a huge fan of the way the game ended as well. It was the type of thing where I could see what was going to happen from a mile away, and I was hoping I'd be wrong, but nope. It happened pretty much the way I expected it to. And there's no New Game Plus mode or anything like that, and as far as I know, there's only the one ending. Oh, and if you're wondering if this version of Cathedral on the Evercade has anything the other versions don't, well, yeah, it actually does. Early in the game, I was visiting Ivy Stone for the first time when I ran into who else but Zoe from Alwa's Awakening. It was just a cameo, she said some stuff and then ran off, but then I was thinking that since she's from the other game in this cartridge, if it was unique to the Evercade. So I looked up some other gameplay from other platforms on YouTube, and she doesn't appear to be there, so there you go. The Evercade version of Cathedral may not have achievements, but it has Zoe from Always Awakening. Like I said, I found the game extremely fun and I enjoyed all the exploration and fighting, especially the boss fights. There were a few parts I felt stuck at, and I turned to the internet for help, but then when I discovered the answers, I felt extremely silly I looked that stuff up because the solutions always seemed obvious in hindsight. I considered looking up and collecting everything that I missed, but I didn't think there were any additional bonuses for collecting all the armor augmentations or exploring the map to 100%. But I could always go back to my save file and do that if I want to. Till then, you can call me Crow, the, the suicidal, suicidal expert, expert explorer. explorer. Alright, here we are, we're going to rank these games, it should be fairly quick and simple since there are only two games, but uh, one of them I did like better than the other, and I think it's fairly obvious which is which, but the one that is not my favorite is Always Awakening the 8-Bit Edition. So the question is, where on this uh, list am I going to put it, which here, and I got to put it on perfect. Now when I say perfect, it's not literally perfect. If you think about it, I don't think any game can absolutely be 100% perfect, but uh, perfect for all intensive purposes for what it is. Um, maybe a slight flaw here or there where there's uh, items to collect and I couldn't uh, quite figure out if there was a point to collecting those items, like the tablet. Once I got the tablet together, maybe I'm missing something, I don't know. But uh, for what the game is from start to finish, it's a great game. Which, which means that Cathedral, man, even better than that. In fact, Cathedral is so good, it's probably the best game on the Evercade. At least my favorite game on the, uh, the Evercade by such a huge margin. I'm going to have to go through and rethink the games that I've previously put on the perfect level just to think to myself, does that really belong here when compared to Cathedral? Uh, so... Yeah, it's, it's just uh, uh, fantastic what the game is, and, and there really is nothing else like it on the Evercade. That and uh, Always Awakening. I, I think these are the first two Metroidvanias that we've gotten. I might be wrong, I might be missing something, but just, um, just outstanding games, both of them. All right, so let's rank this cartridge containing Always Awakening and Cathedral. Here we're looking at my current rankings for all the cartridges. And it may have changed since the last time you've seen it. I'm always kind of shifting things around, uh, rescoring things and the like. 
Uh, I, I do go by a score, but then I'm adjusting those scores just to put it more in a finely tuned the order in which I like to, th to see things. So um, where am I going to put this cartridge containing Elves Awakening Cathedral? Well, definitely tier one. But where on tier one? Would you believe the very top? <laughs> yes, that's right. Right now, so far, this is my favorite cartridge. I spent way more time with this cartridge than I have with any other cartridge. I think altogether I spent about 40 hours with that. 10 in Owl's Awakening and 30 in Cathedral. Uh, blowing away any amount of time they may have spent on any other cartridge. And I had a blast with every single second I played both these games. So yeah, I have to put it at the top for the time being. Who knows, maybe I'll change my mind. Uh, but again, it's it's... An awesome car. I can't see it going uh, below tier one anytime soon. So with that there, let's just readjust uh, renovation, put that back on tier two. Uh, Morph Cat we're going to put on tier three. And Pico Collection 2 is getting pushed back to tier four. Just uh, so, I, so I can have things evenly distributed. That's the way I'm doing things. So that's uh, potentially how things can shift from tier to tier as we go along and look at each of these collections. So that's going to wrap it up for Awa's Awakening and Cathedral. And next I'm going to be looking at these six games in Irem Arcade 1. So, until then, I'll see you all next time.